And those are the rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis and others that are caused by autoimmune disease. And those are the ones that you see the advertisements on TV for Humira and some of these other drugs. And those have been fantastic and they've really changed the course of rheumatoid arthritis. So we don't see people really like we saw them 25 years ago with the damage to their joints uh, due to those inflammatory conditions because they can be arrested at least to some degree with these medicines. Osteoarthritis is different. Osteoarthritis is, typical osteoarthritis is what we all probably experience to some degree. And that's age-related, heredity, and injury. Now you can subdivide that into post-traumatic arthritis, and that's the old knee and regional college which catches up with you later, or you know, major trauma kind of things that lead to arthritis. And when we say arthritis, what we're really talking about is destruction of the cartilage in the joint. Because um, I get the question, like, can you scrape the arthritis out while you're in there? But that's a misunderstanding. We don't, it's not a substance we remove, it's the wear of the cartilage. So some options. Um, you know, there was a time when we would tell people that, uh, you know, you just need to hang in there. And um, when you're coming walking on your walker, we'll take care of your head for your knee replacement. And that's because these joints didn't really last as long as we would have liked. So we had a joint, when I started practice, there was some expectation it would last 10 years or so. But now, we have joints that, in all expectation, are gonna last a lifetime. Even in some of our younger patients. We've got data that shows 93% success or higher at 20, at 20 years. And the new 25, 30 year data is coming out and it looks like it's gonna be very similar. And when they take these implants and they move them in the laboratory and they simulate 30 years of wear, there's very little wear. And the reason that is, is the plastic components, particularly in the hips, are so much better that they're 10 times more durable. Their wear rate is much less than it once was. And so that's what really has allowed us to do these surgeries in younger people. Yeah. Um, the, um, of course, heat and cold therapy is helpful. Um, just to alleviate symptoms. Physical therapy is very helpful. Now, it's really activity, and some, some people need that help from a physical therapist to get them moving, and the idea is not really a long-term relationship. If you see the therapist, you want to come up with a physical therapy plan, and then you carry out that plan, and you incorporate things that you enjoy enough to do, and that gets your heart rate moving a little bit. So, when you have arthritis, if you're a couch potato, it's going to hurt. If you get up and you move, it's how your body interprets pain. It diminishes uh, the discomfort. And so lots of repetition without undue stress is really what we talk about. So cycling sometimes is great. Aquatics is fantastic. Walking, you know, lower impact type activity. Um, and then anti-inflammatory is really the cornerstone of, of treatment. So, um, you know, things like Aleve or, or Advil, Ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen. I usually tell people Aleve just because it's more convenient. It's every 12 hours you can take, the bottle says one twice a day, two twice a day is actually less than the prescription dose. And that's really the mainstay of treatment. Things like acetaminophen can help, but they really don't help that deep pain of arthritis like the anti-inflammatories do. Now, a lot of people have medical conditions that preclude them from taking the NSAIDs, and, and then they, they take the Tylenol. Now, there are other medicines that we use, but we certainly, as you know, try to stay away from any opioid uh, analgesics now. Um, now, other alternatives, uh, non-operative alternatives, are injections, and there's really three, three to four types. So, one type of injection are the high ionic acid injections. A lot of people call these the chicken chops because they make them from chicken parts, mostly the comb of the rooster is where it's coming from. And so they concentrate this stuff in that syringe and we put it in your knee. And that's usually done as a series of shots, three to five shots usually done a week apart from one another. And we call it a lubricant shot, but in reality it's really an anti-inflammatory shot and it decreases the inflammation in the knee and therefore decreases the now you got also you got to think about where the pain's coming from in the knee. Knees get inflamed. Osteoarthritis, although we say it's you know it's it's not autoimmune, there is an inflammatory component of it. And so 
these shots decrease the inflammation within the soft tissues, but when you're bone on bone, there's nerves in that bone and that hurts and those shots aren't going in that bone. And that's why a lot of people get relieved from the shots because they get to the point where most of the pain is coming from the bone and the shots are no longer affected. There's also steroids. Short-term steroids have been a mainstay of treatment. We try not to do steroids until we're really just buying time. So steroid shots actually are a detriment to the cartilage. They can cause the cartilage to wear a little bit uh, more quickly and they're actually toxic to it. So we try to stay away from those until the point where we're really not worried about doing damage. We know what ultimately we're going to be able to take care of after the surgical procedure. But this is a new arrow in our quiver here. And this um, Zilretta, we've been pretty happy, I've been pretty happy with it. So what they did is they took the same substances to make resorbable sutures out of, and they make little uh, globules of it, and they put the steroid in that. We inject that in your knee, it attaches to the lining of the joint, and it's released over three to four months. And that's a single shot, and it's very quick onset, as opposed to the hyaluronic acid injection, where you have to get five shots, and then they kind of kick in. So this has been really helpful, and I've been really happy with that. And because the steroid is released so slowly, we haven't seen the toxic effects on, this, on the uh, cartilage. So this, is, this has really become one of my go-tos as far as injections. Now we also have biologics. Now biologics and orthopedics are in their infancy. And so we have the ability to do stem cells, we have the ability to do PRP, but we don't have the ability to rejuvenate the knee. So when you see these out, there's a lot of quackery, there's a lot of snake oil out there, so, and there's reasons for that, but these shots decrease the inflammation just like the other shots do. And they're a good option for some people. So the PRP particularly, we draw your blood, we get a component of that, and that has some um, substances in it, including the platelets, that decrease the inflammation in the knee, so they mitigate the inflammation. It's a single shot, it can last 9 to 12 months, and so it's really helpful. The downside is uh, insurance companies, Medicare, don't cover it, so it's an out-of-pocket expense. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, you know, and it runs about $1,000 or so. Now, we have a lab, actually. Dr. Turner runs this lab, and it's, it, we make sure that you get exactly what you're supposed to get. It's not something we mix up with a kit we got from somewhere. It's an actual lab that does it. So we do some testing to make sure you're getting what you need. And it's a good option for a lot of people to keep them going. Now the other one that you hear about is BMAC, is bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And this is the stem cells that you see people advertising. And there's various, ways, there's various stem cells, okay? So first of all, they're not stem cells. They're mesenchymal cells that mitigate inflammation. And so when we take, we draw the bone marrow, we get a component of that, we inject that in the knee, it also decreases inflammation. It does not build cartilage, it does not rejuvenate the knee. Nobody can do that in the United States. Nobody. Because the studies that have been shown that do possibly increase the cartilage are combined with surgery that removes the damaged cartilage and then injections of cells that have been cultured. And that's done outside of the United States. The results are so-so, it hasn't been approved for use in the U.S. But when you, the implication on how this advertising is, come in, we'll give you stem cells, it'll rejuvenate your knee, it'll create cartilage, it just doesn't happen. Now there's other things that are used, there's adipose derived cells, um, we can suck out, it's sort of like a, a free removal of fat cells, so we remove all these fat cells, we get a component of that and inject that in the knee, again, those are men, uh, those are cells that are not stem cells, they're the mesenchymal the cell, cells. And then the other thing that you see is amniotic fluid, and just people are injecting amniotic fluid. That's been studied, that's been looked at, there's no viable cells in that. It may decrease the inflammation to some degree, but they, the implication that those cells are going to go harder, which is just nonsense. So uh, another option short of joint replacement is arthroscopy. And arthroscopy, the role of arthroscopy has changed during my practice lifetime significantly. So 
We, in the past, we were much more aggressive about doing arthroscopy and arthritic joints. The feeling was if we could just wash out that joint, it would help with the pain, we could diminish uh, some of the discomfort, keep it going. What we found is it's really helpful for people have increased mechanical symptoms. So let's say your knee's worn out and then within the knee is the meniscus, the rubber-like cushion. And you tear it out, a piece of that starts popping in and out of your knee, causing mechanical symptoms. We can go in, trim that up, keep it going. We can smooth over the cartilage, particularly in the kneecap, keep it going. But it's applicable to just certain cases, not everybody. Um, and then there's joint replacement. And so basically, we start considering joint replacement when the other options really aren't viable. And when, um, excuse me. Can we help you? Oh, I've got to grab some chairs. I'm trying to be quiet about it. Okay. When I got to grab some chairs for a meeting, I didn't know what was happening. Okay. All right. Um, so anyway, you might you might decide to have a knee replacement. Um, first of all, these other options just aren't doing it. You've gone to the point where you're having discomfort. And again, like I said, we used to tell people come in when you can't take another step to replace your knee. But now it's how is it impacting your lifestyle? If you gradually cut back on your exercise because your knee hurts, do you think twice about going on that trip to wherever? Can you go do the things you want to do with your grandkids? You know, is it waking you up at night? Night pain is a big part of this. So it's all those lifestyle changes that bring you to that decision to have a joint replacement. Um, and so total hip replacements. <laughs> um, Total hip replacement has really changed in recent years. And so we're doing things now to keep people from being unhappy with their hip replacement. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, when you talk about uh, arthritic hip, this is just a picture of it. I think everybody knows what we're talking about. This is basically the cartilage wears out. In a reaction to that, your bone kind of tries to increase the surface area, your body tries to increase the surface area, you get your bone spurs, they sometimes add to the problem. And so this is what it looks like on an x-ray. That hip on the left, you see the nice space between the ball and the socket. Um, that's the, the normal cartilage on the right. There is no such space. It's worn to the point where there's cysts that form in the bone. Now this is fairly advanced, not everybody gets that far, but um, basically, that's what the normal pretty kid looks like. So, I think this is going to play a video. Muscles, 
And we are able to access the joy, do the things that you saw on that video, and get out. And we can close the wound with a single plastic surgery suture longitudinally. This also is more easily anesthetized. So we could do a block here. We do, while we're doing the surgery, we do some injections. And most people are comfortable enough where they go home within three or four hours and we do this as an outpatient in our surgery <laughs> and, this, <laughs> and, and this has been a game changer. When I started my career as a resident, Run to the people would come in the night before, they have their H&P, they've been in the hospital, they do the surgery, they put them in bed for two weeks, and then they go to rehab, and it was just totally different. So that's one thing that's really attracted me to this. Again, I'm sports medicine trained, and this is really the, you know, minimize the surgery, accelerate the rehab kind of sports medicine approach, and this has got, been taken into joint replacement. Um, this is actually an interop picture, and so when you look at on to the left there, my PA Jared's there in the middle, and that's the incision. The incision, that's a plastic cover that we use, it's about this big around, and we're doing an incision within that. And you can see the robot, we'll use the robot in some of these cases, we've got the image up on the screen there, and um, we're able to very precisely place that in. And again, there's been a transition to where all these are done at the hospital to where these are done as outpatients. Whether they're done at the hospital or whether they're done at a surgery center, they're still generally done as outpatients. So even at the hospital, usually the day, either you go home the same day or, or stay over just one night. Um, now this is a patient, now he just had his hip replacement and this is three or four hours afterward.
just under the kneecap, sometimes that weight loss really makes a big difference because you've got that mechanical uh, advantage that you have that your kneecap gives you going upstairs, allowing you to lift that much weight with that little knee kneecap. But if you take a little pressure off it, it decreases the wear and the pain. So total knee replacement, we can do the replacement of just what's worn. So we do a partial knee replacement. Now, predominantly those are on the inside of the knee. 90% of those are worn out on the inner side, inside. We do an occasional lateral. We do do the patellofemoral joint. If, again, if you've just worn out that kneecap or the trough that it sits in, we can replace only that. Now, rarely would we combine those together. If you're in a situation where you're gonna, you've got more than one area that's worn, we generally do a total knee replacement. The partial knee replacements also, at least traditionally, have not lasted as long as a total. Um, but that's changing. We're getting better data on the partials, particularly the medial. And it, it depends a little bit on age, too. So the partial knee replacement is a really good option if you're 45 and maybe it's going to last 15, 20 years and you're going to have to have everything done. That transition from a partial to a total uh, is a very good outcome on that total knee. Now, if you had a total knee when you're 45 and you have to have it replaced with another total knee, the outcome is not quite as good. Not, it's still good, but it's not quite as good. So that partial knee, we generally do it in younger people, although that's changing a little bit and we're seeing some people have even if they're in their 70s, if they've only worn that inside and they want a partial, we can consider it. But what usually happens is the partial doesn't necessarily fail, but the rest of the knee catches up eventually. So uh, on the left is a partial knee replacement, on the right is a complete. And when we say replacement, you know, again, we're talking about a resurfacing. We're making tiny little cuts on the end of the bone. They're about eight millimeters in depth and then we're replacing that with metal and plastic. Um, these are the components. I, I meant to bring, they're bringing some actually, some models. Oh, but, there ah, we go. We can show that to you later. Um, now, the striker components are designed so that the tension in the tissues remains about the same through a full range of motion. And that's particularly well designed for use of the robot, the Mako robot. And so um, the robot has been really helpful. And the big thing that sets this apart from, from other robotics is that there's in the, in, during the surgery, we're checking the tension in the tissues and making our adjustments based on that. So what happens is if we use this robot, we get a CT scan. We take that information that goes in the computer. Then during the procedure, we're touching the bone with a probe, and that tells the computer where, where the bones are. So it, it has that information on both the CT and there's real time. And then in the past, we, there was something called computer navigation would be done. And then we'd say, well, we want to make a six, six degree cut on the end of the femur. We want to do a neutral cut on the tibia. We want three degrees of slope, and we'd plug all these numbers in and it would make those cuts. And there really wasn't a tremendous difference from using the mechanical instrumentation and doing the measurements. The difference with the Mako is during the procedure, we can, I can stress the knee one way, stress the way the other way, the knee the other way. We do the measurement of the space, and then we make the cuts based on that measurement. And so we customize the cuts to the knee. And that's why we can minimize the amount of soft tissue that we have to release. Now, it's, it's not helpful necessarily in every knee that we do, but some of the more difficult knees, particularly if someone who has a big bow leg or a big knock knee, what we would do is we make the cuts on the bone and then we release the tissues until we have a balanced knee. But now, we can balance the knee with minimal release of the tissue. Therefore, less surgical injury, therefore less pain, therefore quicker recovery, and a more balanced name. And this is not new, but it's been, it's been tweaked and improved over the last 14 years. Um, and it's everywhere, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's something that's being installed 
everywhere. And I think at some point, you know, robotics are really going to take over a very large part, if not the majority, of knee replacements. This is So, you know, we say we're alive, and some people think we just, you know, make go take the wheel, but it's not that. <laughs> so, um, I've got my hand on the saw, make go, it, it's part of the robot, I'm guiding that, and um, it has something called haptic. So, as I get to a certain point, it prevents me from going any further, and it does minimize the potential for doing additional damage um, with the saw. So, and I get to, it's like a video game. I'm looking at the video and looking at the information as well. Um, and this is us. This is in our ASC. Um, that's me in the middle. And uh, we, it's, in addition to what they talked about is, the way this, we, we, we register all these little points, but the way the robot knows where the leg is, is these little arrays here. We're about to put those in, so there's little pins, and we put the arrays on there, they're like a satellite dish. And then in the room, this up here, way up, yeah, actually, yeah. I had to take this away from my docs. <laughs> there you go. It's not gonna work there. It's good. No. But anyway, um, yeah, good, good. So that right there, you can think of that as a satellite. In the room, and and these, um, and basically it's a GPS system, so it tells us where everything is in space within a quarter of a millimeter, something like that. Not a millimeter. Whoa. Okay. So then recovery. Whether they come to your house or you come to them. 
And so what's important is what you do all day, every day. So if, if I tell my patients, if they only do physical therapy and they don't do their exercises daily, they're not going to do well at all. So they got, you got to look at the physical therapist who's just coaching you up. So we could do that through home health usually for about two weeks and then go to outpatient. But most people now actually want to start out in our, um, in our physical therapy. So we'll do the surgery on Tuesday. By Thursday, they're in physical therapy, sometimes Wednesday, and I'm seeing them on Monday. Sometimes they're Wednesday and they're there for their second visit in physical therapy on Friday. Um, and then <laughs> they talk about this one year follow up, but we, it, you know, you come in, I'm there, and we're wondering why we're there, right? Because <laughs> most people are doing so well. So that's rarely done now. So usually, I'm seeing you back in a few days, just check the balloon. We see you back in two weeks to remove any sutures or staples. We see you back about six weeks to gauge your progression, and then usually kind of a three month checkout. Come back if you have any problems. Um, and everybody's a little different. Some people, of course, need more attention to that. Some people, I mean, I saw three guys this morning at six weeks for like they had already met their three month goals, so there's no real reason to come back in. Um, <laughs> this is David, right? Okay. Um, so usually what I tell people is, you know, by two weeks or so, you're losing the walker. By six weeks, if somebody saw you walking in Kroger, they probably wouldn't know you had anything done. You're certainly aware of it. You're working on your exercises. <laughs> by, by three months, you're thinking about walking for fitness in the neighborhood. But it probably takes nine months or so to just kind of forget your knee, just forget that you had a knee replacement. And most of that is due to the natural resolution of scar. So when we do the surgery, the tissues are very thick, they get scarred and all that just has to soften uh, to give you time to kind of forget about your knee. Um, and then activities afterward, um, again, you, you want to get back to, this is why you did it, to stay in the game, whatever the game that is. So you get back to what you want to do, as long as it's low impact. I don't know why they put this in there. <laughs> I was looking at it before, but it is true if you have your right knee done, usually you shouldn't drive for about six weeks after that is fine. Although I now know how many people two foot it, it's amazing. There's a lot of people out there two foot it. But generally, low impact activities are encouraged. Golfing actually did a recent um, study and it takes 0.8 off your handicap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then they talk about limitations here. Actually, I had a talk with one of my patients this morning. She's 48, had a hip replacement, wants to go skiing. And if you're already an accomplished skier, the feeling is you can't. You're probably not a black diamond skier anymore, anymore but you may be a blue uh, skier. And if you're already, already accomplished at it, it's okay. Don't take up skiing after you have <laughs> 70. Running is, is discouraged, although a little bit of moving around quickly, pickleball, doubles tennis, that kind of stuff, that all that's fine. Um, contact sports, no, we shouldn't be out playing football. Anything quick like this, anything with a lot of jumping in it, usually. And the idea is because the impact is thought to loosen the implants from the bone. At least that's what we've seen in the past. I've had some non-compliant patients that seem to do okay, but it's not recommended. So basically, when you lose that twist and ouch, shut up, then you want to get back to whatever, whatever activity you want to do. So, and, and you guys, uh, I'll, I'll play this just one more time. This is, that's our campus in, in Noonan. We also have the office here. But that's actually our surgery center right there. Surgeons in hip and knee surgeries. The Mako robot helps our doctors to be more precise during surgery. Excessive so head with less pain. So you can get back to what's important in life. Georgia Bone and Joint. Move better, feel better, sleep better. But our, our office here, I didn't mention, is in the whole Fayette Medical building over um, on Shake Rabbit. And we're actually building a new office. It's going to be uh, across from Smith and Davis over at the mm -hmm. So we hope to have that in the, yeah, in the next year or so. So, questions? Yes, ma'am. Anesthesia.
anesthesia. How long is the patient out? Uh, well, it depends a little bit on the procedure, how difficult it is and everything. Uh, roughly an hour uh, for both hips and knees, something like what that. What if you're very sensitive to anesthesia? Well, uh, I'm not an anesthetist, so I can't get into details, but um, because of the block, you know, first of all, our center is a teaching center for Medical University of South Carolina, Medical College of Georgia, Emory, and I'm leaving somebody out. People? I don't know. But the nurse anesthetists, as they go through their training program, they all rotate with us. And the reason they do is because of their expertise in blocks. And so because we can do the block, it really minimizes the amount of general anesthetic that you need. And so we try to minimize the use of opiates. That's what we really try to do. And so that's why people can wake up and have their wits about them and be able to leave within three or four hours. Now we don't do a lot of spinal anymore for that very reason, because people are leaving and they gotta be able to have their full muscle function and their bladder function and all that. So generally, we do more general anesthetic but it's because we're able to use more blocks, and so the general anesthetic is light, not light anesthetic. Yes, ma'am. Can you do the total knee with just the block? Uh, with just the block, no. We don't do just the block. And we do with the spinal, and there are people that, from a medical reason, need to have the spinal, for whatever reason, and we can do it just on the spinal. That's not a problem, but just the block, no. And when we do the surgery, just like the hip, the block covers the front of the knee very well, but not so much the back of the knee. So during the procedure, while we have access, we do those injections. And that's what keeps you comfortable when you wake up. But we got to get there to do the injection. And getting there would be uncomfortable and there's just a block. So. Someone on Facebook asked, is surgery time longer with the Mako and how does it affect infection rates? Um, I haven't seen any data that shows a higher or lower infection rate, really. I don't, I'm not familiar with anything that's addressed that, so it doesn't seem to increase it, uh, any infection rates. And it probably, it may add 10 to 15 minutes to my time in order to put the array in. You know, we talked about you have to put the pins in to do the array, which is the little satellite dish. And then we have to mark all the points inside the knee. So it adds a few minutes, not really significant amount of time. Yes, ma'am. Do you do ankle replacements? I don't, but Dr. Heinz does. My partner does. Yeah, and he does them actually in our surgery center. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. You mentioned your specialty being shoulders, et cetera. Are you going to discuss that at all? Uh, not today. My specialty? No, we're not doing shoulders today. I'm kind of, I'm not doing shoulders like I used to do shoulders. My partner, Dr. Cushing, does, particularly any, uh, and Dr. Walker does shoulders as well, but replacements, replacements only Dr. Cushing on the does. Shoulder replacement also has had great strides, and there's been real changes in the components, um, particularly shoulder replacements for, due to rotator cuff disease. Um, there's actually a reverse shoulder where we put the ball in the socket and the socket on the ball side, and it increases the leverage that, so much that people can do really, really remarkably well. So just like the changes in hips and knees, the same sort of thing's going on with the shoulders. The rotator cuff takes longer to heal than, I mean, longer than most surgeries. It takes a while. I have money now. I'm very empathetic for shoulder problems. <laughs> yeah. But then you, yeah. have, you have to have the shoulder replaced. What's the, what's the time period on that? Uh, as far as recovery? Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, you start moving fairly quickly. For the first six weeks, in order to access your shoulder, they have to move some muscles. They have to let that heal so you don't strain it by pulling in too hard or externally rotating too far hard. And then things progress from strengthening. So, you know, I don't, you know, I, again, I don't do that, so I can't tell you when you might be swinging a golf club or something. I think probably five, six months. Elbows? Elbows are rarely done. Elbows, um, they, we do them 
in light of fractures, sometimes when in some of our older patients, if they shatter their elbow rather than trying to fix it and try to get it to heal, we just replace it. So that's been a change. And then um, elbow replacements are generally for for folks that have low demand on their elbow. Yeah, how do we replace it? Who, who, would, who would you look? Oh, oh, who would do it? Um, yeah. In our group, I think, um, <laughs> you know, they've done so infrequently, I think I've been the one who's been doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, there are some guys that do a lot more of those, and there are, so that's done so rarely that sometimes we'll go, we'll refer, refer you to somebody that does a lot more of them. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.